Hi everyone, I hope you're doing all right. Right now I have so many books in the backlog that I've started collecting my thoughts on but haven't yet finished. Uh, some of those reviews will be coming soon, others probably will honestly never see the light of day, and that's okay. But today I wanted to talk about a book that's been most recently on my mind, which is a long but fascinating non-fiction, multi-generational family story that I just finished, Wild Swans by Jung Chung. Okay, let's stop right there for a second. I had a hard time figuring out how exactly to pronounce the author's name, and most of the interviews I watched said something like Young Chang, which, well, she may have anglicized her name, but that can't possibly be very close to the original. From what I was able to find, it must have been something more similar to Zhang Zhong, which an anglicized pronunciation of that would be something more like Zhong Chang. Uh, so I'm going to go with that for this review. Uh, but please do let me know if you speak the language and have any insights into this or know of resources that would just help me do a pronunciation more true to the original for uh, Chinese names. So Zhong Chang grew up in the People's Republic of China and became a teenager in the 1960s as Mao's cultural revolution was just beginning. Her family, including herself, her parents, and her grandparents, experienced firsthand the dynamic politics and society of China throughout the 20th century, and her book Wild Swans is an account of these experiences. Starting with her grandmother's experiences, then moving on to her mother's, and finally describing her own youth and beyond living in China, she tells a story that combines well-known political, cultural, and historical events that shaped China, with loads of personal and more closely relatable stories and experiences. The book reads sort of like if you were to sit down with, say, your mother one evening, and each night she told you one story from your family, uh, starting with the earliest stories she'd heard from her grandmother, and then the stories of her mother, and then finally arriving at her own story. Rather than one story with some definitive beginning and end, it really reads like a sequence of stories, uh, each somewhat self-contained, but also given extra meaning and context by its positioning among all the others. And maybe I'm making it sound disjointed by this point, though. It's not. These stories are told in more or less chronological order, each coherently connected to those before it to give it the proper context, but there's never a sense that we're building up towards some great finale in the last 50 pages. The pacing of the story is just steady throughout, so that every story is potentially equally interesting from the first to the last. I found this book fascinating. It's not what you'd call a joy to read. At times it is, but that also kind of minimizes the fact that at a lot of times it can be horrifying, full of war, violence, abuse, political witch hunts, and more. Uh, the author doesn't linger on these details, but she doesn't brush over them either, uh, which is important to seeing the full picture. But that full picture contains plenty of hope and joy as well, uh, even during the family's and the nation's darkest times. I especially appreciated how this book illuminates different perspectives that were prevalent during China's communist revolution and beyond. This book is certainly not what you'd call politically neutral. Uh, it's hard to imagine such a thing existing in 20th century China, as I've come to understand, uh, because all parts of life were seen as political. No, Zhong Chang is ultimately quite critical of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, or CCP, especially of its ruthless leader Mao Zedong. And despite this book becoming hugely popular worldwide, it's banned to this day in mainland China for how she talks about the government. Uh, but rather than just rip on the CCP for the whole book, Zhong Chang tells the story in a more complex and ultimately believable way. You really see the hope for a different and better society that the early Communist Party represented for many Chinese, most prominently in how Zhong's father and mother, especially her father, placed their trust in the party but ultimately found themselves disappointed. Not only that, but we see how even if what communism ultimately became in China uh, by the late stages of the Cultural Revolution was not what the people had hoped for, this was not necessarily a preordained uh, conclusion, and furthermore there wasn't a clear better alternative at the time. As an opposition to the ruling Kuomintang, uh, who many Chinese citizens saw as ruthless and corrupt, the communists, even if imperfect, represented an alternative. A ruling power that could at least possibly be good for them, uh, unlike the Kuomintang, the alternative that they already knew firsthand were not good for them. And in this way, I found the book a lot more insightful for understanding the common psychology of communism and later Maoism than a book like Frank de uh, The Cultural Revolution, which I've reviewed as well, that book has its merits, but it just doesn't really shed any light on why communism was so appealing to so many Chinese people in the first place, and instead portrays communism in China almost as if it was an utter disaster from the very beginning, one that no reasonable human being could have possibly supported except as a means to gain power. This book also serves as a quick overview of most of 20th century Chinese history, at least covering that middle half of the century from the end of imperialism to the end of the Cultural Revolution. 
We never get too deep into the weeds with historical details so as to lose the personal touch, but Zhong Chang also doesn't plan for her audience to know all the history, so she gives us plenty of relevant context. Thus, I don't think you should be discouraged from reading this book, even if you don't know much about 20th century Chinese history, nor would it be boring if you do already know a lot about the topic. For my part, when reading I now knew some about the history starting with the Great Leap Forward in 1958 and up through the Cultural Revolution, but didn't know too much at all about the stuff before that, and I still found both halves of the book equally readable. The historical period in this book begins towards the end of Imperial China, in which the author's grandmother was born in Manchuria, or the northeastern region of modern-day China, which places it in close proximity with Russia, Korea, Japan, and Mongolia. We learn a bit about the struggles between regional warlords in the crumbling empire nominally led by Emperor Puyi, uh, but most of that history is really for another story, and the beginning of this tale is more fully centered on the personal experiences of Zhong Chang's grandmother, who married twice at an early age, first as a concubine to an unloving warlord who disappeared for, I think, six years immediately after their wedding, and then later, after he died, to a much older and much more loving man who was a doctor. We hear the struggles her grandmother went through in navigating the traditional constraints of Chinese society based on gender, class, ethnicity, and more. And we also begin to learn a bit about Zheng Chang's mother's early childhood. Then we progress to a period dominated by a struggle between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party, the two sides in the Chinese Civil War, and how ordinary citizens were affected by the constant tension and warfare between these two rival groups. In the midst of this all came a pause in the fighting, well, a pause in that fighting, during the Japanese occupation during the period known more broadly now as World War II, which brought about a whole new form of restrictions and discriminations against non-Japanese locals. I'm glossing over this because there's a lot of complexity to it and because I don't know that much about it. And as I've already mentioned, uh, you won't receive a full history lesson from this book, but you'll learn enough to understand how these various occupations affected the locals and often completely reversed people's fortunes and social standing in a matter of days. A trend that would continue uh, once the Communist Party, led by Mao, eventually established a firm control over the country. But what I really appreciated here is that you get a bunch of these personal stories that capture life in these time periods, the kind that you'd miss or wouldn't feel quite as connected with if they were just included as supporting evidence in some more academic history book talking about, say, the end of World War II in Manchuria. And then came Mao's heyday in China, which would last for around 30 years after World War II, waxing and waning at times, but never totally disappearing, always to emerge again alive and kicking. As Mao's communists gain increasing control over the province and rooted out remaining existence from the Kuomintang, who eventually fled to Taiwan, the communists also became increasingly broad in their definitions of enemies. We learn how Mao thrived from pitting his own people against one another and often created enemies where arguably none really existed. Although our narrator's mother and father became communist officials, and even some non-party members experienced relative prosperity for a little while compared with conditions under the Kuomintang, eventually this would all change as the party began to probe into the pasts of their members and root out so-called bad elements in the anti-rightist campaigns and ultimately in the cultural revolution. Not to mention there was Mao's great leap forward in the midst of all this, which was pretty widely recognized as an utter failure even among those close to Mao. You wouldn't want to say this to Mao himself, of course. But this ill-planned push to boost the economy, reminiscent of Stalin's five-year plans in the earlier Soviet Union, likewise led to a nationwide famine lasting several years that really took its toll on pretty much everyone, ending any initial prosperity that we'd seen under communist rule. So this is all the historical context in which the story occurs, but we get to experience this through the struggles of Zhong Chang's parents and their associates. And her parents were fascinating people, in, in some ways the most interesting people in the story in my opinion. Both were party members, and although the story was mostly centered on the author's mother at this time period, we do learn quite a bit about her father too, and the two often serve as sort of foils to one another. Both were initially devoted party members with a certain idealism and a true belief that communism could better the lives of society around them. Neither was interested in using the party for personal gain, though they eventually came to see that this wasn't exactly true of everyone around them. Uh, but whereas Zheng Chang's mother held on to some concept of traditional values such as family loyalty, emotional expression, and free thinking, values now criticized under the new communism, her father became fully devoted to the cause of communism in its most ideal sense, 
in many ways, I respected him enormously for this. For example, we learn how he was so opposed to the old ways of corruption and favoritism that he likely hindered the rise of many of his family members in the party so that he wouldn't be setting a bad example of using his position to benefit those close to him. But in his relationship with Zheng Chang's mother, this meant he was often very cold to her, refusing to confide in her or use any of his party privileges to her advantage. Even for example, when she was truly struggling, like when she was pregnant and on the verge of miscarriage, and instead of letting her ride in the car, he forced her, in accordance with her rank, to continue walking for miles and miles of harsh conditions, which all made him a good communist but a lousy husband a sentiment that she expressed directly at times. Still, the marriage wasn't all bad by any means. Through their narrative of both conflict and reconciliation, we get to see how their relationship and their loyalties would change over the years as their eventual five children were born and grew up. And one of those children is the third main character, the author, Zheng Zheng. We hear about how she grew up in a privileged place during these early years of turbulence in the party, though she didn't quite realize it at the time, and was even blissfully unaware that there was a famine going on because her parents would always give her their food to ensure that she was well fed. We see how she was indoctrinated into the cult of Mao in her early education, which approached the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, though she was arguably never quite fully indoctrinated because I think certain reservations of her parents had their way of rubbing off on the children, even if Mao was almost never questioned explicitly in their household. In high school, she became a member of the Red Guard, uh, though in a reluctant and uninspired way, as she tells it, uh, always with a sense that something was not quite right, but not daring to question the status quo either. A little more on that in a bit. But here we see some of the strongest exploration of totalitarianism in Mao's China. That is the extension of politics into every aspect of one's personal life and even one's thoughts. At this point, I'm thinking I might even create a totalitarianism playlist or something because there are just so many books I've been reading that explore this theme, uh, both through fiction and nonfiction. Everything Zhong Tang did was ostensibly done in accordance with communism, specifically Mao's latest words about communism, and people were devoted to Mao like a god. The author explores, of course, how it was never quite certain how much of this devotion was heartfelt, how much was fear-based, and how much was simply performative, concluding that for most people, including herself, it was probably a bit of all of those. And here, especially in the sections about the Cultural Revolution, as it became more and more of a witch hunt, we really see how scary this kind of society can become, in a way that hopefully carries some lessons for our own present-day societies, too. I'm not going to go deeper into these parallels here, but I think it's a super interesting topic, and I talked about it more in my review of Frank DeCotter's The Cultural Revolution, so check out that one if you're interested. We really feel the scariness and the paranoia of this period in China, but also see how the perverse incentives were there for people to turn on their neighbors and fellow party members when it was to their advantage. Importantly, we see also how it never really worked, uh, because the tables were constantly turning so that even the most ruthless politicos uh, zealously climbing the party ladder would soon find themselves on the other side of the criticisms, whether because they had a distant relative who was once a Kuomintang official, or simply because a jealous neighbor reported that their devotion to the party was motivated by personal gain rather than true devotion. Which was, of course, ironic when it happened, because to some extent at this point, that's how it was for just about everyone. The cover of the book's most recent version depicts this three central women of the story, complete with a blurb from Hillary Clinton extolling it as an inspiring story of women who survived the worst life has to throw at them. I think this is pretty accurate. I, I also think it's a shrewd bit of marketing. That is to say it's true of the book, but if I could say one sentence about the book, I think there's much more to be said than this. As an aside, I personally am, have nothing major against Hillary Clinton, but you don't have to like Hillary Clinton or self-identify as a Democrat, liberal, or whatever to read this book. Uh, the book is not so politically charged on the left-right U.S. political spectrum as it is on a divide of Western capitalism versus Eastern communism, and that too is a vast oversimplification, so please don't go too hard on me for saying that. But to the point of Hillary Clinton's blurb there, this book is the story of women, of women living through almost a century of life in China, navigating circumstances that, especially towards the beginning of the book, but even towards the end of the book, were challenging for women in unique ways. It's not a book that pits women against men. There are many kind and admirable men and women in this book, and also many rotten ones. But it doesn't shy away either from describing conflicts between men and women, often resulting from different cultural standards and expectations of women and men. And it explores the ways in which communism sometimes did and sometimes didn't live up to its supposed ideal of 
promoting greater equality between the sexes. So most of all, this is a story that centers women, instead of treating them as merely an afterthought, as the wives of all the key political figures, or something like that. And that's why I do agree with the general characterization of the book as a story of women in China. Now, at least a few reviews I read accused the author Zhong Chang of minimizing her own family's role in the tragedies inflicted by the Chinese Communist Party. The author indeed casts her own family as highly sympathetic throughout the story, and whenever a challenge is approaching that seems to present an impossible dilemma uh, with only two horrible options to choose from, they always seem to find an out. And if not, they do choose the noble road, even at the cost of great personal suffering. In particular, she portrays her parents as loyal to the communist cause, but only up until the point where they had to throw others under the bus. And there, they ultimately always took the fall themselves when push came to shove. Similarly, she freely acknowledges joining the Red Guard when she was in high school and being expected to denounce her classmates and teachers and participate in house raids. Uh, but as she describes it, despite being confused at times about the whole class struggle element of Mao's communism, she was always extremely uncomfortable with any actual violence or denunciation and even went out of her way to comfort the victims. Are we seeing the whole picture here? Honestly, it's not really for me to judge whether the author has whitewashed her family's past a bit especially because it doesn't make much difference to the value I found in this book. I read the book with full knowledge that, like the stories passed on from anyone's mother and grandmother, they might not be completely factually accurate. They might gloss over one's worst moments, or maybe not. But ultimately, we're not reading this book as a historical vindication of the author's family. We're reading it to learn about history and the way it was experienced through the eyes of this family, even if sometimes in a subjective or selective way. Furthermore, this is kind of a separate point, but I have to ask myself if I really could have expected any better of myself than of the Red Guards had I been an impressionable young teenager whose parents avoided any critical talk about politics and whose education was full of propaganda extolling the eminence of Chairman Mao and his controversial and sometimes cryptic teachings. In fact, there's one review I read on Goodreads that really stood out to me, and I want to explore it further because I'm quite sympathetic to this, even though I don't really draw the same final interpretation as the writer. The review writer explains that their great aunt was the one whose house was raided in one of the events described in this book, one in which the author Zhong Chang participated, by her own description. Uh, the review, which I've linked in its entirety below, says, quote, I feel extremely uncomfortable about how she portrayed herself as the witness and the victim of the Cultural Revolution, when the truth is that she had a very active role in it. It goes on to say, quote, Also, I am extremely angry as the descendant of the real victims of the Cultural Revolution. We, the real victims, the black kind, lost everything in the so-called revolution when the author continued on studying in a prestigious school in Beijing and ended up in the UK. End quote. What can I even say to this? It certainly is uncomfortable in reading this book to think that the author and her family in some cases did cause suffering, even sometimes by the author's own admission, and maybe sometimes not. At the same time, this was a society in which there weren't clear answers or clear ways to simply opt out of the system. Did the author and her family make mistakes? Almost certainly. However, it's also tough for me to judge the way they acted within the unenviable situations they found themselves within. I feel for the writer of this review enormously, but I also think it's a bit dangerous to start talking about who are the real victims of the Cultural Revolution. Because here we're once again stepping into the binary black and white thinking that was the backbone of Mao's philosophy and of the Cultural Revolution itself. Yes, some people suffered more under the Cultural Revolution than others. And yes, the author was relatively well off in the sense that she was in a privileged situation where she could avoid the very worst of that suffering and eventually even escape the country altogether, allowing her to write this book. But as soon as we label one group of people the real victims and the other group the false victims, we're continuing that same old cycle. First, it was the non-Japanese inhabitants of China who suffered under the Japanese occupation then it was the local communist under the Kuomintang. Then it was the former Kuomintang under the communists. Then it was the alleged former Kuomintang and rightists under the communists. Then it was the capitalist rotors within the communist party under the Red Guard of the communist party. Then it was the rebel Red Guards of one faction under the Red Guards of a competing faction. It's a pattern that we still see today, which is that one day's oppressed group can easily become the next day's oppressors. So without dismissing that there were various classes of victims in the Cultural Revolution and that not everyone suffered in the same way, I think we have to be really careful about sorting them into the real and false victims because it's just not that simple. I'm still really thankful for this review though because I think one really valuable thing I can take out of it is 
a reminder that although the Cultural Revolution was ruthless in its persecutions and made victims out of many different classes of people, the author's family were, as the reviewer points out to us, not the only victims. To whatever extent such accounts exist, we should aim to read other perspectives. Go and read an account by someone whose family was deemed blacks, that is, the people of the worst possible class background. Hey, even go and read a more positive account by one of the primary beneficiaries of the Cultural Revolution that's not critical, although I think you could argue that no one really made it out without some amount of struggle. I mean, even the future and pretty well-beloved President Deng Xiaoping was condemned and rehabilitated multiple times during these turbulent years before eventually eking it out alive at the end of it all. But my point is, they're all valid perspectives. We don't have to pick one that's right. So let's go out and read other perspectives, even in other formats, uh, if not in a full book form like this one. More perspectives is almost always a good thing, and we should read Wild Swans with a grain of salt. <laughs> okay, so there is so much I missed in this discussion still, as this story remains intensely relevant to modern politics and modern life. But I'm going to leave it there, and I hope to see more people reading this book and discussing it. Uh, in summary, though, Wild Swans is a rich story and one well worth reading for those seeking to learn about Chinese history, culture, and personal stories. Of course, it's not the entire picture of the 20th century in China, uh, but one could hardly expect it to be in such a dynamic country with a billion different individual stories to tell. It's not a short read by any means, but it's one that I think many readers would enjoy, as I certainly did. Now, thanks for watching my review, and I'll see you next time. Happy reading.